this little hour, we're going to listen, think about, contemplate, analyze this information coming from the Buddha. Why? So we can take some tools from it to develop our amazing potential so that we can help others. That's the essence of it, really. So thinking like that. So we think we, we hear that we've got this precious human rebirth and we almost seem a bit cynical about it, you know? And I think it's simply because we have this addiction of dissatisfaction, which is the consequence of practicing attachment for countless lives. The suffering of attachment, the consequence of attachment, you see, attachment is this false expectation that over-exaggerates delicious things. So whenever you meet the thing that you're attached to and have all these over-expectations, you always get disappointed. So actually it brings more dissatisfaction. That's the suffering and the irony of attachment. Not only getting the objects, getting the job, getting the boyfriend, getting the food, whatever the object is, getting the praise, not only does it not bring satisfaction, the tragedy is it increases our dissatisfaction. So because we have this terrible dissatisfaction with who we are, what we are, what we've achieved, then of course we don't think, when we hear that Buddha says, you know, especially in Atisha, Atisha, this marvelous Indian scholar who, you know, he got to Tibet after about 1800 years of Buddhism being there. And he, he kind of wrote this little text called Light That Guides You On Your Path. And so he, his very preliminary little contemplation that he says we need to do in order to be energized to even want to enter into the path is to first contemplate the preciousness of this life. And so if we have this dissatisfaction, if we also remember this, even if we're Indian, I'm sure we don't always have the view of karma, you know, so many people have the materialist view these days. And if we've got the materialist philosophical view, first of all, we've got attachments, then we have the philosophical view of materialism that says that our mother and father made us, or if we're Christian, or even if we are Hindu, maybe we believe God made us. So in either case, in both cases, there's almost this feeling of disconnection about who we are, you know? So you, I didn't ask to get born, we will say. Then we have dissatisfaction. So then to hear that we've got a precious human body, we, we're cynical. What do you mean a precious human body? Look at the rubbish I am. Look at my lousy life. Look what happened to me. I didn't ask to get born. Look at the people who fired me. Look at the people who are mean to me. It's like a joke to think we've got a precious human birth. So we've got to really look at this because it doesn't inspire us. I mean, the reason Atisha puts it right at the beginning of practice is to energize us, to inspire us, to understand the unbelievable treasure that we have having a human body and the conditions are reasonable conditions. I mean, this is very abstract for us. We don't, we don't have that view at all. And so then secondly, sometimes we might, some people do have, you, you know, we feel very great, grateful, somehow things go well, we're very happy, but it's unusual. We're usually dissatisfied. So what does it mean? And what's the implication? What's the point? What is our teacher trying to get us to do? What's the action point in hearing about contemplating this precious human rebirth, you know? Well, I mean, it's, it's really, it's like doing market research. What our teacher is getting us is to look around and compare our conditions with the conditions of millions of other humans, forget about animals. I mean, if it's too abstract for us to think we could have been born in the animal realm, forget that. And I think, you know, you, we'll find we actually, even if we don't have a, you know, we'll find at a, at a simple level that we have incredibly fortunate conditions. So how do you find that out? Well, look around the world, you know. I mean, you know, sometimes you see online these, uh, like, you know, 1% of people have a computer and 3.5% of people have this and 10% of people have that. But actually, you know, it's a bit like, you know, we talk about the 0, 0, the 0, 0.1% of the rich people. We are about, we're probably the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.001% of the fortunate people on this planet, but not in terms of money, in terms of having a combination of a whole bunch of conditions that if we understood the causes of them, and this is especially where the view of karma comes in, if we really understood the causes of them, it would blow our minds. We would never want to waste a single second of this precious life. So the whole, so in other words, the attitude we're trying to cultivate, you know, is that we've got a resource. What does it mean, this precious human rebirth? It means we've got a resource. And that's the key point. You know, it's a bit like I use the analogy of money. Let's say, you know, maybe, I come in Europe and I think some countries have 500 euro notes, you know, 
500 euro notes. I know in India, you cut out all the more than past 100 because you had to do this cleaning out of your money. All the poor people had to drag out their old euro, your, your old rupees, didn't you? Probably people lost millions of rupees in that big drama that happened in India a few years ago for the for you foreigners they you know because lots of Indians stack their money they keep their money in their wardrobe maybe they don't trust the banks maybe they don't trust the banking system I don't know what but people keep their 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 rupees you know and they've got thousand rupee notes and then one day they had to call in all the old notes so people had to finally confess they've got this hidden money you know it wasn't very happy for people anyway never mind that so the point I'm getting at is this and such a simple example it sounds silly but listen to it Let's say, you know, um, I use this ridiculous example. Let's say, you know, you've never heard of the concept of money. You've never heard of the concept. And, you know, and, you, and, you, and somebody, somebody visits you one day and they discover you've got this box of these pieces of paper. They're small, they're oblong, and they've got maybe 20 and maybe 30 and maybe 50 and maybe 100 and maybe 500 written in the corner. And they're probably a bit sort of dirty looking, the art isn't so fancy. Some of the countries have very nice art on their money. And you look at this thing and you see it on face value. Hear my point now. The face value is a piece of paper, a bit crumbled, probably dirty. And I swear to you, if you hear the research about the amount of junk on money, heroin, caca, PP, the most disgusting things we would never normally touch. If you saw a dirty piece of paper on the ground that you know heroin addicts have been touching, you would not touch it in a million years. But honey child, we know if you understand money and it says 50 even, forget 500, you don't care how dirty it is. But my point is this, my point is this. On face value, a 500 euro note has, you know, if you don't understand money, here's the point. This is not about emptiness, people. It, you see it as a dirty piece of paper. You, and then you observe there are quite a few of them and they've got the same art on every one. There's the same picture of some white man, no doubt, on the money. Maybe some have some white women, you know, who knows? I don't want India. They're all, what do you got in India? I forget the rupees. So you look at it and you see it on face value and you say, oh, I don't like that art. It's very dirty anyway. And it's too small. I can't do anything with it. Hear this point. It's very simple. But if your friend knows about money and they see this box of these pieces of paper and you just want to throw it in the bin and it's even too small to use as a piece of toilet paper, excuse me, hear the point, they would be absolutely shocked. So what's the point? It's they know that, yes, in essence, it's a piece of paper, but they know it's this that it's a resource. It's something we all agree upon that if you go into a shop, you will get a whole bunch of things for that 500 euro note, that 50 euro note, that one euro note or five euros is the smallest ones. So we understand the concept. Well, that's exactly the same. On face value, this is a bag of bones. This is a walking sewer. This is a disgusting thing. It's a piece of flesh inside this body. You would vomit if you saw it all coming out of all the different holes. And you know what I'm saying. On face value, it is revolting. It's nothing fancy. When we're young, the skin is a bit smooth. We get a bit carried away. But in general, on face value, it's nothing. But when we understand the concept of reincarnation, the concept of karma, the concept of... Um, virtuous karma and negative karma and then we realize like that 500 euro note if you understood money you would never forget and this is my point now you would never forget for one second how many hours of work that 500 euro note represents so from that perspective you know it is a resource it's you got it from something and you would never want to waste even one euro of those 500 forget even a one euro note you'd feel sad if you only got you know 67 cents worth for your euro i mean it's not a difficult concept so the thing is with this human body we don't see it like that we think someone else gave it to me we look in the mirror we think we're ugly we only see the bad things we're totally dissatisfied we take things for granted in other words we see there are people who are poor i mean the vast majority of the human planet are poor the vast majority on the human planet you don't maybe, you know, I mean, maybe don't have a particular, don't have good conditions, good food or good houses, whatever. But we take it for granted because there's no sense that we earned our conditions. There's, there's a feeling that you see these pieces of paper and they're boring and you don't think that you earned them. So you don't value them. So we don't value this human body. I mean, just the human body alone, which comes along with a human mind, 
And then all the conditions we've got. You know, we all know if we look at Atisha's teachings, he lists about 18 different points that we should contemplate. The various conditions that we have got and the various negative conditions that we in fact haven't got. So the more we understand karma, and we realize we earned that 500 euros. So no matter how dirty it is, we do not care. We know its value. And so we would never want to waste it. So that means it's a resource. And that's the concept of a resource. A resource is something you can use to get something. Well, what is it we can use this human rebirth for then? That's the point. And this is what takes us time, you know, because we take ourselves for granted. We might even say thank you to God for making us. We might even say thank you to mommy for making us. But we're still not getting the essential point. The Buddha, I mean, if we understood how much virtuous karma of two main things, really, as Lama Zopa points out, just to get a human body, and there's 7 billion, maybe 8 billion of us, but look, at you've probably got 7 billion mosquitoes in one afternoon in your backyard in Delhi. So it was obviously easier to get a mosquito body a dog body, a monkey body, you know, it's obviously easier if we take the view of karma. So then if we've got a human body, just to get a human body, the virtuous karmic seed of non-killing, a very strong, delicious, rich, intentional karmic seed of non-killing has to ripen at the time of our death. And in our case, it did. But, not, but just even having a human body is not enough. Lots, we need conditions lots of conditions, external conditions, and they also are not accidental. They also are the fruit of our past karma. So the conditions we need are really to have access to money, food, a house, to all these things that enable us to survive. So we have the luxury of leisure and time to now make the most of this human rebirth, which is use our mind. What for? Well, bare minimum, to use this body, this com so okay, the karma we need to have the right conditions, you know, and that's pretty rare on this planet. We think in terms of money, good resources, good conditions, good education, good friends, good support, good environment. The, having conditions that enable us to go ahead and have the luxury to to then start a spiritual practice, which is the point of this human. This is the point of this resource. You need masses of generosity karma. So one, you need non-killing karma. And two, you need masses of generosity karma from the past to get to be born in a decent human body with decent human tendencies from your past practice and reasonable conditions so that you can have the luxury of spending your time to then do the real job, which is continue to work on your mind from the past lives, carry on your spiritual practice so that we can get the hell out of samsara, you know? So of course, it's a big mouthful. It's a particular view. It's the Buddhist view. And we have to think about it. It doesn't come naturally to us. So, you know, so the, you know, so the, 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 that's why the 500 euro note's a really good example. On, the, on face value, yeah, you might be ugly. I agree with you. You might be ugly. You might be fat. You might be unhealthy. But you've still got a human mind. You've still got this human body as a result of your own past non-killing karma. You've still got reasonable conditions. So try and see the bright side of things, please. And you, while we've got it, utilize these conditions. Utilize this precious human condition and the conditions and our body and our mind to continue, one, creating the causes to at least get more of the same which is practice virtue, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, practice generosity, practice good ethics, and you die with a happy mind and karma takes care and you will get another decent human body with decent conditions. Then more than that, as we know, more than that, we can use this precious resource to unpack our mind, get to the root of the problems, give up attachment, get renunciation, understand the delusions, understand suffering and its causes. And we can do more than that. We can add bodhicitta to the mix. We can cultivate bodhicitta, this aspiration to bend up at others. And finally, we can realize emptiness and become enlightened. All of this we can do with this human resource. So of course, we've got to be inspired by this. Maybe it just sounds like intellectual boring stuff. And because we're overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day of getting food and taking care of the children and trying to make grandma happy, we're overwhelmed by our normal daily life. You know? So we forget the point of this 500 euro note. 
And we start seeing it, oh, it's no good, it's ugly art, it's dirty, I don't want that, because you forget its meaning. So this is, of course, the Buddhist view of the meaning of this human life, you know. It takes a while to get through to this because we, we have all these other views. I didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault. I'm fat. I'm ugly. Life's a drag. It's not fair. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's complaining about the art of the 500 euro note. It's complaining how dirty it is. Who cares? If you know it's a resource you can use, get to the point, cut to the chase, see its actual meaning, value, if you like. It's got meaning. A 500 euro note has meaning. Well, this human life has meaning. It's a strange way to say it because one of the biggest sufferings on this planet is we don't know the meaning of life. What am I here for? Why am I born? One of the major things that people get so depressed about, we don't know why we're born. We don't know why we're here. We don't, you know, so we're puzzled. What am I doing on this planet? Who put me here? You know, it's a very strong suffering for people. This is Buddha's answer. So really it's up to us, you know. So talk to me now. I didn't stop for 20 minutes. So now you can ask me some questions. If anyone has a question, they could raise hands via reaction. So just send me on the chat and let me give you the option. Okay. We really got to think this through. It doesn't come naturally. We think this way, you know, we don't, it doesn't come naturally to us. We've got to, we've got to analyze this and think about it and give us to get us. And still the energy of inertia in us is very strong. You know, the wish just to stay in our comfort zone and, and be full content. So yes, uh, Abelardo, talk to me. So Thank you, uh, Venerable. Uh, okay. How, how uh, can one uh, strengthen one's faith in rebirth and therefore karma? Uh, of course, of course, it's a big one, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know all the basic arguments, but uh, yeah. I want to know your, your opinion, please. I understand that. I understand. You know, I mean, it, initially, of course, for all of us, if we take the Buddhist view, we're taking this view here, we're taking this as our working hypothesis that our consciousness is not physical, it's not the handiwork of a creator, it's not the handiwork of mummy and daddy, it didn't come from nothing. So these are all our, you know, we know the views we're taking. And we can, we can study these views and say them very nicely, but it seems it does really take time. There's no shortcut, you know. It really does take time to have confidence in this view as being, um, as being a valid view and therefore being inspired by it and wanting to use it. But, and, and there's no shortcut. And the only way, it's like anything, you know, you know, you, let's say you're dying to learn what Einstein knows. You're dying to learn about E equals MC squared. It's going to take a while to incorporate, to learn all the stages before that, to study it, think about it, study your math, study your, you know, your abs, all, your, all the boring things before you get to the point where you can really use intellectual knowledge to that degree. So same here to get to the point where we've got experience of the truth of reincarnation and karma, which we will eventually will begin to access when we've got single point of concentration. And let's face it, probably 99% of us won't get that in this life because we don't get ourselves the appropriate conditions. So it just demands continually thinking about it. I mean, there's no shortcut. You know, if we have, you start by, I mean, one of the key things I always like to say is, you know, if any body of knowledge is valid, it has to first be, coherent intellectually. So that's the level we have to work with. There's no other level we have. We don't have access to our subtle mind. We don't have access to our ability to be clairvoyant. So one is we need to study it. But the other thing it seems to me that can give us encouragement, can help us get confidence, is when we listen to the Einsteins of the world, meaning the Dalai Lama, the, 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 the scholars and the saints and the yogis who are renowned as having direct experience of these things. I think that's encouraging. I mean, if you're trying to become like Einstein and you never meet a scientist, you get a bit depressed. You can read your books till the cows come home. But if you meet some scientists who, and that can be very inspiring, they can, wow, it looks like it is possible. Same here with this. That's why it's so inspiring to have good teachers, to have these highly evolved, genuine, sincere yogis who are great scholars as well in front of us, telling us about these things, giving us some increasing our confidence. So I think these are the two methods. There's no shortcut. That's all I try to do. I mean, it's, 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 there's, there's no shortcut. And, and, and the other thing is, it's, you know, sometimes we can be a bit emotional about it. And I think we can have faith in something, but I think we confuse it with liking the idea of it. And we can convince ourselves. But as soon as some argument comes along, or as soon as you get a bit depressed, all your faith goes out the window. You need some, that's why we, we, it's good to have confidence and feel buoyant about it. 
and think and be confident. Yes, yes, it makes sense. But we've got to ground that in, in study and knowledge and contemplation. Do you understand my point? There's no shortcut. Use all the tools that you've got and just keep moving in it, you know. But I think the for me, the big one of, of seeing the examples, hearing the examples, you know, hearing the Dalai Lama talk, hearing these different lamas talking who are said a renown to be experienced in this knowledge and have the direct insight into it. They mightn't confess to it, but that gives me great confidence. That's huge, you know. What do you think? Uh, can, can I ask a related question? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, uh, well, I'd like to know which study sources you would recommend. Uh, I, I study quite a few, uh, but uh, uh, also um, what is your uh, understanding of uh, the subtle mind that re reincarnates. Um, uh, I know the Chita Matra view of uh, Ali Bayana, uh, but that's not shared by everyone. Uh, in the Prasangika tradition, what, what would you say? Well, I think the, funda no, the fundamental view, I think that the Buddhist, the fundamental view, and this is especially in, um, you know, the tantric teachings, um, they talk, I mean, His Holiness Dalai Lama talks about this, and just now there's one Lama teaching in Portland, in Oregon, Jada Rumacha. He's giving an empowerment tonight, actually, if anybody's around. In about five hours, I think, probably you'll be in bed in, Sydney, in, in India. But anyway, he, it's uh, Jada Rumacha talking about that, the, that, especially the Vajrayana point of view, it's very encouraging that the way they describe the components of the universe. The universe consists of minds, and then the universe consists of matter. And there's this inextricable relationship. All minds are inextricably linked to their own four set of the four elements because the, all the matter of the universe is made of the four elements. And so the, and that model, as you must know, and that's described in the death process, you know, the death process. And that's also something very encouraging to, to study the death process, which is coming from the Vajrayana model. But, you know, Lama Zopa's book, for example, there's Lama Zopa's book called How to Face Death Without Fear. It's been, it's been out a couple of years now with Wisdom Publications. Lama Zopa Rinpoche's book, how to face death without fear. I mean, I'm familiar with it because I happen to edit it, but it's 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 going through it's it really touches on it in all this in great detail on the whole process of death, what happens, how mind goes from life to life. It's very, very helpful. And it's mainly framed in terms of how to help our loved ones go through the process of death, including our pets. You know, it's a very helpful book, highly recommended. How to face death without fear. So the, the, we've got the gross consciousness. Which, which is our physical body that we can see. And it's evident that that's inextricably linked to our gross level of consciousness, which is our sensory consciousness. It's evident you, you've got to have to have an eyeball and all the nerves working properly in order for your consciousness, the eye consciousness to have a cognition. So they've got to, they work together, they're inextricably linked. Then once that stops, you've stopped breathing, the senses have ceased, but now your subtle mind is paramount and your subtle mind, which is your mental states, they're, they're so-called subtle. And they're coursing through this series of 72,000 subtle channels, this subtle nervous system, along inextricably linked to the different wind energies connected to them. All our different states of mind are coursing through our body, linked to their different wind energies through this subtle nervous system. I mean, this is a system the Tibetan medical system studies. You know, if you go to your Tibetan doctor, she'll feel your pulses and she'll feel the imbalance of certain wind energies and she'll know that's connected to your attachment or your anger. So this is something that's because the mind and the body are inextricably linked at this level, at the subtle level. So then you've got the very subtle consciousness as you keep going through this death process, this process of deconstruction of the various components of the person. By the time you get to the subtlest level, that's called the clear light consciousness. And that's this very subtle level of our conscious being beyond which it can't be subtler. That's inextricably linked to the very subtle, the subtlest level of the four elements, which is the subtle wind energy. And they're like one entity, separate in terms of their function, but they're one entity. And then that was, there's what then leaves the body propelled by past time and then it would find its new rebirth. So it's all, it's described, Ramazoba talks about this process and it's described in detail. And there's a very excellent book by His Holiness, another book on, on death, the process by His Holiness Dalai Lama. I think it's called The Mind of Clear Light. And it's a commentary on a text about this process of death by the Panchen Lama. It's called The Mind of Clear Light, edited by Jeffrey Hopkins, translated and edited by Jeffrey Hopkins. It's really interesting. So that, I mean, this is where there's great detail in the tantric teachings and the Vajrayana teachings about these things, more so than in the sutra teachings. These things help. All reading all this is quite helpful. It's like technology. It's very, it's very interesting. And there's also you, a lot, oh, yeah, 
Could you please repeat the name of the, of the, the project you, you mentioned at the beginning? I didn't get that. The first book. The, the first project, you said something, the death project or something like that? Oh, no, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a book by Lama Zopa Rinpoche. No, before Han that, before oh. that you mentioned something, uh, a project of, of some sort. Yeah. You were talking about the Indian, <clears throat> uh, the Tara tonight, <clears throat> the, oh, the Tara. Oh, the I just Tara mentioned blessing. one Lama who's giving teachings at the moment. Is that what you're talking about? One Lama who's giving teachings in Portland all week. And he's been, he's finished, he's got one, he's, tonight he's got, there's an empowerment tonight in Tara, by the way, if anybody's interested at um, 8 p.m. Portland time, which is, but is that what you're talking about? No. I mean, no. A no. I don't remember the project. I'm so sorry. My Australian accent. I don't know what <laughs> I was talking about. No, I don't know what I'm talking about. A project. I don't remember. I'm really sorry. That's okay. I don't Thank remember. you. I'm sorry. Okay. Anybody Thank you very else? Much. Okay, pleasure, pleasure. Anybody else have something to say? Oh, when will we have questions in the in the chat? But there's Pradeep Balu who's raised his hand. Maybe we could ask him. Yeah, please talk to me. Pradeep, Pradeep you have Pradeep. a question? You want to unmute? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes. yes Go on. Yeah. Thank you for for giving this lecture. Uh, so I just want to ha have a lot of questions. But uh, right now, what question I'm getting in my mind is, so the, the conditions right now I'm in, uh, like my surroundings and uh, uh, my family, they're going through suffering. And I'm also going through some kind of a suffering. Okay. So this are all actually uh, because of my past karma or, uh, or, else, uh, or else it's uh, maybe uh, it's naturally it's happening. That is my question. What, and how what, what is my direction should be in the path of what is the question, Pradeep? I didn't get the question. What's your question? So right now I'm in I'm in a circle of samsara, right? So I'm in the uh, in the world of suffering, and I have family. They are also going through suffering, right? So my question is, what should be my direction in the path of enlightenment? What should be the first step? Well, I mean, it's like asking me. I understand. It's a good question. So you're a bit saying you're saying to me, you 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 know, you've learned about, you've heard about tennis. So what's my first step on learning tennis? What would you say? What would be your answer? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat again? Okay, you're asking me what is the step? You what is the first step in learning Buddhism? Is what you're asking, right? Isn't it? Um, maybe what what should be my direction or approach should be because uh, in enlightenment we should we should be uh, no not self centric person right okay so wait, no, listen 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 it's something i understand your point i'm trying to get it down to earth i'm trying to get it down to earth so what we're discussing here is there is a whole body of knowledge called buddhism and the buddha has found that if we work on ourselves we can turn ourselves into an enlightened being okay so far so good Yes, yes. Okay, good. Now, okay. It's a body of knowledge. It's a body of knowledge, Pradeep. So what would you do if uh, with a body of knowledge? You'd learn it, wouldn't you? You'd enter in at the beginning of a body of knowledge and you'd start to learn it and practice it in order. Would you agree with that? Yes. Pradeep. So then you have yes. to... So that's why I said to you, if you learn, you heard about tennis, you've heard about music, you've heard about mathematics, and you're saying to me, what is the first step? Well, you, you learn the body of knowledge and you, learn, you, you go to classes, you, un, you begin to understand the knowledge, you understand what is enlightenment, what is this, what is that, and then you start to learn it and you practice it. There's no shortcut. So, you know, you can, this, this group here running this teaching, they have courses, you can email email them and discuss with them. There's many Buddhist centers around the world, but I would suggest now that you're on this class, you can talk to the, you know, the director, so he can speak up now, he can show you where he is. Talk, director. Yes, please. You could just email me at info at cksl.in and I'll guide you to all the offerings that we have and the other centers have as well. Yeah, Pradeep? Yeah. Yes, sure, sure. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank I you. think that's the broadest answer I can give, Pradeep. There's no quick fix answer. You need to start at the beginning if you're interested and have long-term perspective and study it and get a daily practice and go one step at a time. Do you understand okay. me? That's the only solution, isn't it? And anything you want to try and learn. There's no quick fix. There's no magic. 
okay so can i ask one more question very yes. short question yes so if if my my problem is because of my karma i can i can i need to bear it and then i can i need to solve it but what if my surroundings are also facing a suffering can i help or what, what, what if what what if what pradeep my, my family or somebody is going through some suffering me, darling, first of all pradeep first of all pradeep this is a very interesting question right now this talk we're giving a talk about trying to appreciate some of the good qualities about our precious human rebirth and i think your point is a very good one because everybody in this place now if we started listing our problems and our sufferings we would never end everybody's like this but this is a really good point that i'm trying to make here you know you have got actually you've got a human body you've got a human mind you have so many good things but all you're do i mean we all we all do and you're similar we're looking at the problems we're looking at the problems we all have problems it's how the life is but when when you start to realize that you know yes of course it's due to your karma but so are your good things but you've got a human birth and a human mind it's a miracle so you've got to find out i want to use that to understand this suffering so i can go beyond it but to realize you've got good resources right now don't so don't just don't just look at the bad things this is the point i'm making here are we communicating yeah thank you thanks we get the point i'm making a little bit everybody we've all got problems you're absolutely right and it is due to karma but all your good things as well your intelligence your kindness you've got a human life a human body you've got a family you've got a job you've got a house these are not just random events these are the fruit of your virtuous karma your generosity your good ethics you've got all these conditions so persevere with that first question find methods know that you can get out of suffering it's a long term job and persevere in those methods and they will help you help get develop your qualities and then you'll be able to help your family and help other people as well do you understand yes yes thank you thank you so much yes. good pleasure good 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 thank you so much anybody else wendable we have a question in the chat so the question goes that the road to liberation freedom is very long how can i keep going on the road without getting demotivated how can i basically keep going on the road well you know this is in view they call it enthusiasm it's very interesting in the body suffer path if you've studied the six perfections of the body suffer they go into great detail about the about the, the various perfections and the fourth of the six which they say is one of the most important is the in is the development of this they call it enthusiasm or joyful effort or enthusiastic perseverance this is exactly your question so first of all what's interesting and it makes total sense the lamas would all say and it's sensible that the only time you're going to have enthusiasm to do something is when you know the benefits of it this is absolutely vital so this whole yeah absolutely the road to liberation is long and hard So if you don't have much enthusiasm for that if you're not really convinced of the benefits of being free of delusions and free of karma and it sounds a pretty abstract idea I agree with you it's quite a high idea it's not existing in our daily materialist philosophical views so it's a pretty abstract concept so if we don't understand the goal and if we don't have in, we don't see the benefits of the goal then it is logical no matter what it is that we say we will do we will not have enthusiasm and so let's look though at the depth of the obstacles to this enthusiasm and this is where it's a bit shocking the opposite of this enthusiasm is in fact called laziness so there's different levels of laziness and we will recognize them this is a pretty intense one this road to liberation is really difficult you know of course it is it's long term so the first level of laziness and this is our major problem and it's again related to attachment is oh i can't be bothered analyze this look at this we are so addicted aren't we to this kind of inertia of our comfort zone we want everything to be comfortable we want our body to be comfortable the temperature to be comfortable the food to be nice the bed to be comfortable our situation to be comfortable the family to be happy and content the world to be happy we desperately crave and this is attachment for everything to be lovely so you know so then it 
when you see you've got to make effort to achieve something, that attachment, that craving for our comfort zone is directly attacked. As soon, we can see, to look, and this is the obvious thing too, we know to learn anything at all by definition takes effort because you don't know how to do it. So even just to make a cake, to walk a mile, to lose a couple of pounds of weight, it takes such effort because you've got to, you've got to force yourself beyond your comfort zone. This is huge obstacle for most of us, you know. I mean, this is the gross level of laziness. We've all got it. And it's because of attachment, this deep craving to be comfortable. The next level of attachment, and they're kind of linked, you know, is, is, is more subtle and more tricky because it sounds like a virtue to us. Oh, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. Putting things off. We know this is our worst crime against ourselves. So what is the thing that you put off doing? It's the thing that takes effort. And what is the thing that takes effort? Is the thing that you've got to is what attachment doesn't want. So it's quite deep inside us. So we have to, so we and so if we don't see the benefits of doing our practice every day, studying the teachings, thinking about the meaning, getting enthusiastic about it, of course we won't have enthusiasm. Of course we will give up. It's logical. And no matter how many people tell us, yeah, you must make effort, you've got to get disciplined, you've got to do it every day. We know the theory. So we, to be self-motivated is pretty hard. But that's, again, where we can see examples, like my point before, you know, um, to Abelardo. If you can see examples in front of you of people who have accomplished the goal, this is very, very encouraging. In fact, we cannot survive without them. We have to have. And this is very interesting, Abelardo's point as well, about His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I mean, you know, the Tibetan style is very humble nobody when they teach ever talks about their own realizations you would never do that you would never do that and they always say oh i don't know anything and the tibetans understand that style but it kind of in the modern world it kind of backfires you know so there's a story one time in america one student one man was in tears at the dalai lama's teachings he said well his holy your holiness if you don't know anything because they're always saying i don't know anything he said if you don't know anything what hope have we got and of course, it's true. His Holiness kind of, he said, he, he kind of confessed that he didn't know a few things. So even now, when His Holiness teaches to regular people, he talks in a different way because we don't understand this, oh, I don't know anything. It doesn't make sense to us. But he, so at that same talk, he also happened to mention, this is my point to Abelardo. He said, when he first went to India in 1956, he remembered vividly that he had a, he had a, he had a memory of being in India at the time of the Buddha, at one of Buddha's teachings as a poor Indian in the back of the crowd. He said he had a memory of this. And I thought that was very, very it's just nice to hear. They don't talk like this normally. They don't go on about their past lives, you know, but hearing him say that was very, I thought very helpful. Especially if you recognize the Dalai Lama, you see he's a good, valid person. He's renowned as a scholar. He's renowned as a practitioner and humbly saying something like that for us. Little tidbits like that can help. So we need examples in front of us. In other words, if you have to, and just using an ordinary samsaric example, you know, you know, you want to go to the gym so you can get fit. When you look at the effort you have to make, you go to the gym on the first day, you're all excited. By the second day, you think about it, go, oh, I can't be bothered, you know. It's too much effort. Everything is too much effort because you've got to force yourself against your comfort zone. And that's the only way you'll achieve anything. So we've got to know the benefits. So if you see pictures of handsome people with nice muscles and nice and thin and good looking, then you look every day at them. It'll give you inspiration to know, okay, I can do it too. So I'll go to the gym. I'll go past my inertia. And that's just an ordinary example. So we need to see the results in people to show us it's possible to achieve the goal. And we need to be confident about the teachings. And that then you, be, then you know the benefits. And so then you will make effort. But this effort, it has to be incremental, not suddenly one day meditate for three hours and then do nothing for the next month. That's no good at all. It's got to be one step at a time. So you have confidence in the process.
you know, I mean, we, we know the answers, but if we can see the obstacles, it can help us. What else, people? Well, when they will, the next question that we have is that I feel anxious about the fact that I'm trapped in this cycle of samsara. What can I do about it? Well, you're not trapped. You can get out of it. The concept trapped is true. The lamas talk this way. The texts say that. But if you have a method, this again is the same answer as the last two questions. If you know the teachings, if you understand the logic of the teachings, if you understand the logic of the nature of mind, and this is all part of my question, my answer to Abelardo as well. If we study what the mind is and we study what its true nature is and we study how delusions are, not, are adventitious and can be removed, and we can study how we've all got Buddha nature, this gives us confidence that there is a method. If you don't, listen, if you're going somewhere and it's one mile away and you don't have a map, you are right to be anxious. You'll walk around in circles for, for weeks on end if you don't have a map. But you could be on a million mile journey and have a map. And honey, if you have a map, then you don't need to be anxious because you simply take one step at a time. So this we're discussing here the Buddha's map. So it's up to you to read the map, study the stages, study the practices, read the teachings, and then just go one step at a time. And there's no need for anxiety. It's all the same answers, all the same. These last three questions, it's very fascinating. Go on, people. What else? Oh, Wendell, the next question is that how do I help my loved one who are not willing to do the work, who want to live in ignorance? How can you help them? You love them for who they are and stop trying to change them. You do the changing. You be content with your own changing and give example, but stop trying to change them. That's what attachment does. We keep wanting to force other people to be a certain way, and that's because of our attachment to them. That's not compassion. So it's in a sense, it's like mind your own business. Love them for who they are. Stop pointing out their faults and keep working on your own mind. And slowly by example, maybe you can help them. That's a major thing. Otherwise, you'll go crazy. That's a simple answer. What else? Uh, Wendable, one more question that we have is that all the experiences that happen to us, is this because of our karma? It happens to be the Buddha's view of the universe. There's no creator. It's not just the physical. That minds, there are billions of consciousnesses, billions of minds. They're not physical. They're beginningless and they're endless. They're the product of the law of cause and effect. Everything that happens to us is the, is the product of a natural law of cause and effect. The logic of it is called the law of karma. It's just a natural law. No one made it up. No one runs it. There's no boss. It's not punishment. It's not reward. It's a natural law that runs the universe. That everything any sentient being thinks and says and does is this process where we produce ourself. Whatever we think and do in the mind produces our future selves. We produce ourselves. We produce our experiences. That's the law of karma. So all your happy experiences are the fruit of your virtuous, positive, ethical actions, and your experiences of suffering are the result of your non-virtuous, non-ethical actions. This is the simple logic of this law. Yes, Paul. Yeah. Thank you so much for the example before <clears throat> with the um, uh, personal examples. I remember you saying in France in one of the talks that you were angry when you moved to London <clears throat> uh, at some director. You were supposed to be the director of uh, guidance. Oh, I know that was and me I, having all my <laughs> expectations. Yeah, I know. I wasn't, it, was, it was me more my own expectations that I would be the boss. Yes, that's it, right. It helped me. No, but the anger... Oh. Is, uh, it, for yes. me, it, it's really helpful how to, you know, be exactly what you said before, you know, love the others and just be yes. with them and appreciate That's them. Right. And for yes. me, it helped me your example of you being angry at somebody because we all, you know, look That's at right. you, you know, project too much into you and not, you know, see your work and the other thing. And can you describe a little bit how you pass through? I mean, you described shortly then. It's like, you know, that person, you looked at it and then Lama Zopa knocked you on the shoulder saying you know what thank you you said you forgive him I, this is what i've remembered uh, no it's not so a it was very story. powerful example i that... like that it was more me joking about how i had this idea how the lamas my lamas lama zopra and lama yeshi their wisdom in seeing my mind and understanding how best to help me on my path 
So, you know, so the way I interpret it was I needed to learn to be humble and patient. So I had the skill to do this job that I thought I was going to be running, but he hired somebody else. So I had to learn humility and patience. So the main point of that was I never, it's not a question of forgiving and I was never angry with them. It was angry, just this anger arose because my I was frustrated. It was, it was more pointing out the skill and the wisdom of my teachers. That they put me in situation where I could learn about my own mind and therefore practice the dharma that's the point that was the point of it do you understand paul yes actually i think life does that every day that's exactly now. right <laughs> if we're, if we're, that's the real point if we're really prepared to learn you know about our mind so the example of helping your loved ones we see that they're suffering and all we want to do is make them happy and sometimes it ends up just we bully them we have to mind our own business and let them be and work on our own selves but attachment and anger are always involved in the outside world, trying to manipulate the world to be the way we want it. And that's what the real practice is, learning to work on our own mind and learn to change our mind. We can mold our mind into any shape we like, as Lama Zopa says, you know. But we keep trying to mold the outside world. You understand, isn't it? This is what practice is, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yes. Who else there? Well, there, there doesn't seem to be any more questions in the chat or oh. any more raised hands. Okay. <laughs> Our time has gone very quickly as usual. Yes. Shuki, how are you, Shuki? There's Shuki in Israel. How are you? All right. Good to see you. Good, Shuki. I'm happy. Who else then? Come on. Any other questions? Any kind of question at all? Venerable, if I may take this opportunity to ask you something. Yes, that, that there seems to be there, so there, so there seems to be meditation, which is, for example, as basic as focusing on your breath and you know, like taking breath as the path and meditating. And while there are other practices, the sadhana practices, the pujas and the offerings. So there seems to be the meditation part, the focusing on your breath is very clear. It's very logical, and your intellect is also satisfied. But there's also a merit collecting activity, which does not really satisfy your intellect, which says that, uh, like, how is that in line with the dharma practice? It seems more religious than more. What do, you mean by, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by merit making? Give me an example. Like, for example, like I see Lama Zubar Rinpoche's teachings, he says this writing the Pratnapati Sutra gives you so many merits. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So you know? we to, what we have to analyze, what does this mean? You know, we, it's, this is just Buddhist language, isn't it? Every, every body of knowledge, every system has its own kind of language. So it's really, if you bring it right down to earth, if we understand the view of karma, which is that everything our mind does, every millisecond of what our mind does, not to mention our body and speech, has results. It's a natural process of cause and effect. So even simply speaking, Every time we have positive thoughts, we are programming our mind in those tendencies. We want that, don't we? I mean, surely it's like practicing virtue. Every time you just have positive thoughts, you're programming your mind in those virtuous thoughts. And why do we want that? Because that's what we want. And every time you're angry, you're programming your mind in negativity. We don't want that. So there are so the, all the practices, you know, uh, you could say there's some of the practices um, are good at helping clean up your mind. I think I call it like pulling out the weeds and they're called purification. And some practices are really good at growing the flowers, which is so-called creating merit. So it's, it's qualitative. There are some foods that are really excellent in vitamin C. There are some foods, I mean, it's really a similar analogy. You know, some food, we know the word food in general, but some food is said to be really excellent for you for this and really good for you for this. And this has got 10 times more vitamin C. This has got 20 times more something else. Are you sort of seeing my point? There are certain foods that have certain qualities. And if you know nutrition well, you will get the best from it. Well, it's exactly the same with practices. There are some practices that are said to be very potent in helping purify the mind. And there are some practices that are very powerful in creating virtue in the mind. That's the bottom line. That's the essence of it. It's not superstitious. I mean, to say religious as if religious doesn't have logic to it. If there's no logic to it, don't do it. And that's what we think of as religion. We don't think it has any real meaning. But everything is about our mind. 
Everything is about our mind. So some practices are very, very powerful for the mind. Some practices are very powerful for creating virtuous imprints. And some practices are very powerful for purifying negative imprints. It's as down to earth as that. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Yes, wonderful. Yes, completely. You might not understand the logic of them. Mm. I mean, like if you're not a nutritionist and some, you know, you abstract some nutritionist who's very clever might tell you certain things and you wouldn't have a clue what they're saying but if you if you value that nutritionist and know they've got logic got, got good knowledge then you will trust their wisdom it's the same here exactly the same i mean lama zopa talks like this and they talk this way it's either a load of rubbish or it's true we can't just dismiss it as some fantasy made up by somebody we've got to see if there is some logic to it maybe we don't understand it but if we trust the source if you trust that doctor, then you will take that medicine. I mean, it always comes down to that. We can't know immediately ourselves everything. You can't possibly do that. Do you see my point? Yes, Wendable, completely. Good. Thank okay. you. Good. What else, people? Wendable, there seems to be a very interesting question in the chat. So the Good. mention is that you mentioned the word, perhaps the word soul. And so the person is asking, is that in context with the Abrahamic religions or, or there's a mention of soul in the Buddhist religion as well? Buddha, okay, we know that the, you know, the Indian religions talk about a self, an Atman, and the Christians talk about a soul. I think there's equivalent. They're very equivalent in terms of there being some special, uncaused, unchanging entity, you know, something that is the core of our being. Buddha doesn't talk like that. Buddha does not discuss a third thing called body, mind, and then spirit or self. He doesn't discuss that. So he talks about we have a body and we have a mind. We are a self, we are a person, but there's no intrinsic person there. We have a body and we have a mind. And the mind, the Buddha's view of the mind is beginningless, it's endless. We've got grosser levels of mind, we have subtler levels of mind. And this mind of ours has the potential to be fully removed of all delusions and all ego and fully developed in all virtue and all goodness. And that finally is when we are a Buddha. Our mind becomes a Buddha. There's no third bit of us called a soul or a spirit. Buddha talks about a mind and a consciousness. They're in the same meaning. He's not discussing the brain. He's discussing this, this non-physical entity called our mind. We've got various levels of mind. We have the negative mind. We have positive mind. We have gross level of mind. We have subtle level of mind. When our mind or our consciousness is fully developed, that's what enlightenment is. That's how the Buddha talks. What else? Oh, Wendable, there's a very difficult question in the chat. So I'm going to read it as it is. So this question is from Mary Allen. So she says that, a question, that her question is about neutral karma. She says that as one internalizes the teachings, naturally they become less emotionally reactive to situations that at one time would give rise to strong attachment or, or aversion. Initially, one would notice the non-virtuous thought, apply an antidote, and that seems clearly creating a positive karmic potential. When through practice, the non-virtuous thoughts don't come up, so no antidote is applied. Does that create neutral karma? Um, I, um, I, you know, neutral is kind of interesting because they talk about the mind, we've got negative, positive, and neutral states. And the neutral states there, these neutral states of mind doesn't mean they're neither here nor there. It doesn't mean they're not, doesn't mean they're not important. They're, they're I mean, like, they're very specific and very functional parts of our mind that are labeled neutral. Now, in terms of feelings, if we look at the, the, um, the Buddhist teachings, we've got the word feeling is very specific. It's in the neutral category. And we either have happy or positive, you know, we either have happy or pleasant feelings. It's called feeling. And there's only three kinds of feeling. We have pleasant or happy feelings. We have unpleasant or unhappy feelings, and we have neutral feelings. I mean, in a general sense, in our day-to-day -day life, you could argue that we only, I mean, we're really concerned about the unhappy and the happy ones. And there's every millisecond, there's always going to be some kind of feeling. And it's not a non-virtue, and it's not a virtue. We don't even think of this in our ordinary daily life. So we have, you know, if you've got attachment in the mind, which is called negative, it's a negative, deluded state of mind, there's attachment 
to something and it triggers a very happy feeling. Like you've got attachment to cake and when you meet the chocolate cake, a happy feeling is triggered. That happy feeling, we even conflate it with the attachment, but it, they're separate states of mind. When you see the ugly thing and that triggers an unhappy feeling, you know, they're separate states. Anger arises in the mind and so then you get a very unhappy feeling because your husband punches you in the nose. But we conflate the anger with the unhappy feeling. We conflate the attachment with a happy feeling, but they're separate states of mind. So a neutral feeling, I mean, in terms of the realms of existence, you know, you've got the very unhappy states of mind continuously, which is the hell realms. Then you have the very blissful states of mind, which are the God realms, are only having happy feelings. But then you've got the subtler levels of, in, in the subtle stages of concentration. You've got the formless beings. You can say that they're experiencing neutral feelings because their minds are so subtle. So I don't think we, I mean, I'm not sure. Neutral karma, I mean, it's neither happy nor unhappy. Because happy comes from, happy feelings are the fruit of virtuous karmic actions. Unhappy feelings are the fruit of um, uh, negative actions. So a neutral action, I mean, in day-to-day -day life, I'm not sure, a neutral action. It's not a question of indifference even. So I don't know, Mary Ellen, is that answering part of your point or not? Speak going. It came up in a teaching the other day and I didn't have a chance to ask the question, but it, the, we don't learn a lot about the neutral karma. We don't learn a lot about but, it, but it was said that the yeah, neutral okay, so karma. Yeah, because we analyze, like, okay, so I see a happy, okay then. So then listen, if we think of this, what is the cause of a happy feeling is a virtuous action. You, when you do a virtuous action and it drops a karmic seed in your mind and then in another life, it will ripen as a moment of happy feeling. You got that point? It's very simple. And if you do a negative action, it'll drop a seed in your mind, a karmic seed, and eventually it'll ripen as a moment of an unpleasant feeling well the third one is a neutral feeling so a neutral action i mean every second of intention attention concentration mindfulness discrimination they are neutral states of mind so you could argue maybe that the result of those would be a neutral feeling i'm not sure a neutral feeling is neither happy nor unhappy but we i mean that even i think even that's mis misleading you know where was it which teaching was it geshe numduck's teaching no, Don Hendrick and exploring. Oh, Don Hendrick. Okay. No, I mean, you, you, uh, it's good you ask him though, because I'm not so. I mean, we, I, you know, day to day life when I talk about ordinary things in the mind, I don't go into it much because it's just not relevant in a sense. We're more concerned with the happy and unhappy, and they're the major ones we've got to deal with, you know. But it's good to know the states of mind, the negative, neurotic, deluded ones, attachment, anger, jealousy, the positive, virtuous ones, love and compassion, for example, and the third lot, intention, attention, concentration, mindfulness. That's why I call them the mechanics of our mind. They are labeled neutral insofar as they're not negative and not positive. So if every action we do and every state of mind has to drop a karmic seed in the mind. And so let's be logical intention and attention and concentration have to also leave karmic seeds in the mind. Then by definition, they have to ripen as a neutral feeling. They would. Yes, I agree. But what that is exactly, I really, it's not a, it's not a question of sort of like in the middle somewhere. It's not like that. I don't think it's more subtle, actually. So in other words, concentration, when you're fully developed in concentration, you're in the highest realms of concentration, you literally only have neutral feelings. You could say like that, that because the mind is so subtle. So that's why, in a sense, the neutral feelings aren't so relevant to us. But I'd like to hear, it'd be good to best to ask John. You with me? Yes, me. thank you. Thanks, darling. Well, people, look, it's gone like an hour, one hour, gone like a dream. So quick, but we made the most of it, didn't we? Yes. Any more questions in the in the in the in this thing, darling? Yes, Mandeville, there was one more, but I think the what is it? Uh, what so is the it? question was a continuation of your soul course, soul answer, which yeah, is good. like so, so if there's no concept of smooth soul in Buddhism, yeah. then yeah. what is it that is taking rebirth then? Consciousness. Consciousness or mind is beginningless and endless. And the law of karma plays out in our consciousness millisecond by millisecond you know, producing happiness and suffering. Our mind becomes enlightened. Our mind goes from life to life. Our mind becomes a Buddha. Our mind has suffering. It's our mind. We don't need a separate part called the soul. It's the mind, consciousness. Mind and consciousness are synonymous in Buddhism. And it's referring to our non-physical cognitive process itself. You have negative states of mind, positive states of mind, you know, and eventually ridding the mind of all the negativities and developing all the goodness. That's an enlightened mind. Our mind becomes the Buddha. 
our mind becomes enlightened. Our mind goes from life to life. Our mind is what causes suffering. Our mind is what causes happiness. Our mind is what suffers in the lower realms. Our mind is what you know, creates the cause to be human. Everything that comes from the mind. The mind creates the universe. That's Buddha's view. That's the law of karma. Okay? Yes, thank you. That's enough for now. Thank, thank you, you darlings. <laughs> Food for thought, everybody. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. So listen, I, I, I was thinking of... Um, Abelardo, I think you you wanted more about the mind, didn't you? You're thinking about the you're wanting more to know about the mind, right? Is that what you're saying, Abelardo? Yes, 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 that's right. Uh, yeah, so I'm thinking what literature would be good for you to read. We'll start with these. I think these two about the death process is very helpful. The Vajrayana model and that one of his holiness. I think you'd really enjoy that one. The mind of clear light. They're good enough now. I think start and you're going to come. You're going to also. You know, there's a really good book published by Wisdom. That's our, the, our Lama, our Geshe in the London Center 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Geshe Tashi, and it's called Buddhist Psychology. And it's a, a very classic presentation, but a very down to earth presentation of the Buddhist model of the mind, how the mind functions, what it is. You know, conceptuality, sensory consciousness. The, so it's a very helpful little book. It's called Buddhist Psychology by Geshe uh, Tashi Tsering. Tsering, I've read that book. It's excellent. Oh, you have read that one. Oh, okay, good. This is really good. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah. anyway, that's it. Okay, good. All right. Okay, <laughs> Thank people. You. Thank you, darlings. Thank Next you. Next time. Bye. Day, yeah. Keep moving. Never Thanks. give up. That's always the answer. Never give up. Okay. Never give up. That's the key to success. Thank you. Thank you.